The interview with BJNN is brought to you by Biz Events, connecting the Central New York business community through events. A state senator since 1993, John DeFrancisco serves as serves a district that includes much of Onondaga County and parts of Cuyahoga County. He currently serves as deputy majority leader of the state senate. Earlier this year, Senator DeFrancisco launched a campaign for the Republican nomination to be governor of New York. He suspended his campaign when Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro secured support from a majority of Republican and conservative party officials. A native of Syracuse, John attended Christian Brothers Academy and later Syracuse University, where he was captain of the varsity baseball team and graduated with a BS from the School of Engineering. In 1971, he received his law degree from Duke University. He served as a judge advocate in the Air Force from 1972 to 1975. Returning to civilian life, he was appointed Assistant District Attorney in Onondaga County and remained in that position until 1977 when he went into private practice. His public service includes 11 years on the Syracuse Common Council, including serving as Council President. He previously held the positions of President of the Syracuse City School District Board of Education. He also served two terms as president of the Central New York Leukemia Society and was a member of the organization's National Board of Trustees. Senator DeFrancisco and his wife Linda reside in Duet. They have three grown children and eight grandchildren. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. John, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is, is uh, kind of non-political. In your role as an elected official uh, and as a Central New Yorker, you've been involved in many projects in the region. Uh, the Case Theater comes to mind, as does Ophelia Place in Liverpool, and Casey's Place, another place. Um, how would you describe what you've been able to accomplish with these projects? Well, each one is so different. It's not, there's not a real theme. And one of them was the Court Blood uh, Center up at uh, the old community uh, hospital campus that's run by Upstate. Uh, these, each of these things uh, appeal to me that could help people. For example, Casey's Place a group of women who had children with multiple handicaps that needed around-the-clock treatment, never got to socialize with anybody, uh, and the parents never got a chance not to be providing some services. So Casey's Place provided that vehicle where these kids could have some socialization and the parents could have some respite time. And it, it, it's one of my proudest achievements, and it still goes strong, as we say today. The court blood, uh, we heard a lot about the uh, use of uh, uh, stem cells to help people. Well, one of the things that was being thrown away as medical waste was the placenta and the umbilical cord on deliveries. And that is rich with cord blood. And there's no, no moral issues about embryonic cells uh, and abortions or the like. And to me, uh, it seemed like a logical mix. Well, it took me a long time, but we finally got it open about a year and a half ago, and it's uh, working now well. And uh, each one, it depended on two things. It had to have, a, it had to have uh, in my mind, a good public uh, purpose and uh, that could help people. Uh, and secondly, the people who I was dealing with had to be someone that could get it done. Uh, you would be shocked the number of times that people have wonderful ideas and you try to provide funding and you provide some seed money, and they go nowhere because they just didn't have the capabilities. So the key is to find the right projects and second, find the right people that you know they're going to get it done. In your years of, of public service, have you learned how to discern those people early oh, in yes. the process? Oh, yes. How because, do you do that? Well, early in the process, you, I can get a feel quite easily for whether people are sincere. Uh, there's a lot of non-profits that are in existence basically to provide jobs for their CEOs. And uh, I could see through that pretty clearly. Uh, I used to request, require a form uh, that you have to file with the IRS, the nonprofit, mm -hmm. that shows who the paid staff are and what they make and that sort of thing. You can, you can get a pretty idea, good idea early on whether these people are in it for themselves or for, or for the cause. Uh, secondly, as you're there longer and longer, you deal with more and more people, and people, uh, we are very free in answering questions about others that are making requests, and uh, you're able to, to make that to work. Sometimes I was wrong, but for the most part, we come up with some good projects. Okay. Now, you've been elected official for four decades, and I wonder, from those four decades, if you might have some advice for voters when they have to go into the voting booth and pick somebody. 
Well, I think the most important thing, and it's, it's difficult this day and age, but the most important thing is to know the candidates. You know, I don't know how many people tell me or call me, who should I vote for? I mean, look to see what people stand for. Look what their backgrounds are. Try to figure out whether this person, like I mentioned earlier, is in it for themselves or they got a true uh, feeling for uh, public service. And uh, sometimes that's tough because you're seeing a 30-second soundbite on a TV show and the person sounds great, but if you don't agree with their philosophy or their positions, uh, sounding great doesn't make, make a heck of a lot of sense for, for the reason that you vote for. I think that's the most important thing. Nowadays, it's tougher because with social media, people can be cut apart. They could be the most uh, uh, in, person with the most integrity, the most character, and with the good motives. And false stuff can come on the internet all the time or by social media. Uh, there's some things said about me that uh, just made me cringe. Uh, if they were true, I wouldn't like myself. And so it's tough to find the right balance as to what is the good information, and, uh, but you really ought to, got to figure out who the candidate is and what that person stands for. You know, what about on the other side, when you talk to people who are aspiring to, to, to follow you in the public service, what advice do you give them? Well, the most important thing is to uh, realize that uh, there's a lot of notoriety but there's a lot, uh, it's very difficult to live in a fishbowl. Uh, no matter what you do, it's going to be uh, criticized by some, and, uh, and um, others are going to be uh, thinking you're the one most wonderful person ever to hold office. And uh, the point is that you got to balance that and realize that you got to have pretty thick skin uh, because uh, you're going to be a target. Uh, but if you're tough enough and you're the person that just is enough confidence in yourself, uh, you'll you'll do the right thing, but you got to know what you're getting into before you start pushing for a job. And every once in a while, I'll talk to a senator, and they'll be complaining about this or complaining about that. And my stock response is always, just think of how hard you worked to get here, what you had to do to get elected. And then they'll calm down a little bit and say, well, wait a minute, this I, I get you. So uh, I think that's the most important message I can give. Okay. Um, I want to take you back in history. You were elected in 1992. Two years later, George Pataki was elected governor. I checked. That was the last time a Republican won statewide for the first time. He won re election, but no one has won for their first time statewide elections as a Republican. What's it going to take? Well, that was a special year. The, I still have my button, uh, a big button with Cuomo's name in it, Mario Cuomo, with a big arrow through it. Uh, and uh, at that point in time, the philosophy was anybody but Cuomo. And I said when I was running around the state trying to get the Republican nomination that this has the same feel to it as back then because Andrew Cuomo is a lot of people to be dissatisfied, whether you're from the left, like Cynthia Nixon and, and uh, Stephanie Minor, or from the right, if you're the chairman of the conservative party. Uh, a lot of dissatisfaction. So the elements are there. The difficulty for a Republican has always been uh, the, how, the size of the vote down in the New York City area. Uh, think about this, when uh, President uh, Trump won, uh, Hillary Clinton got two million more votes than he did out of New York City, out of the five boroughs. Uh, and that's pretty much what happens in state elections as well. There's got to be a huge upstate vote to counteract some of that, or apathy in the New York City area or dislike for that candidate. So I think, quite frankly, I believe that the atmosphere is there right now. And if you have a third party candidate, whether it's Stephanie Meyer or Cynthia Nixon or somebody else, uh, siphoning away some of the vote on the left, then there's a real chance to, uh, to win this thing uh, this year. What about Republicans down ballot, AG, comptroller? Well, you know, I was, when I, uh, got out of the race for governor, I was asked to run for a chair sure. general. I, I had no interest in it. Uh, you know, I practiced law my whole life, and uh, except for until about late eight years ago, and I, I just didn't have any interest in doing that. Uh, but it's similarly difficult. It's even more difficult on the down ballot. You know, Bob Antonacci, who's got the uh, endorsement from the Republicans, conservatives, and independents that succeed me mm -hmm. now that I'm retiring, he tried a statewide race. Right. It's impossible for it was impossible for him to raise the money 
that you need to get the visibility, especially in the New York City uh, media market. Uh, it, it's a cost of fortune to get any kind of uh, uh, TV, pay TV time. So to convince somebody that has the qualifications, the desire, and knowing the money you have to raise, it's very difficult. Okay. John, when, when you were a student, switch to economic issues, when you were a student, Syracuse was the 53rd most populous city in America. I checked, now it's the 175th most populous. What's it going to take to turn that around? There's got to be a totally different uh, philosophy in the cities. I mean, if you look at every single major city in the state of New York, that's where all, most of the problems are. You don't have a city that doesn't have major problems. You've got to, you know, you just can't keep... Uh, providing everything to all people and expect the remainder to be able to afford everything for all people. And I think you can translate that statewide as well. If you look, it's not only Syracuse, if you look at the state of New York, uh, we're losing hundreds of thousands of people every year. In fact, it's been accelerating over the last few years. Uh, and uh, uh, people have just had it uh, with the taxes, the regulation, and, and in my mind, some of the more progressive philosophies that require more revenues and more from those who are paying taxes. And uh, I think that's what you really need. When big businesses leave a state, like whether it's carrier or whether it's um, whatever, maybe new process gear, they leave because they can't make money. And they can't get, make money because the tax and regulatory schemes are just too onerous. So to me, statewide, especially in the big cities, to retain some of these companies and jobs, you got to make it possible that they actually can exist and make money and send higher people. And, uh, and that's why I think the time is right now. I think we're going in the exact opposite direction uh, with whether it's uh, raising the minimum wage, uh, whether it's uh, providing free family leave. It's wonderful. I'd love to provide everything to everybody. Uh, like I do my grandkids, but somebody's got to pay for it, and you got to weigh the balance of the additional benefits. And uh, here's a perfect example: the uh, tip wage. The restaurant owners, uh, the uh, state the governor wants to raise the uh, wage of waitresses to the amount of the minimum wage, fifteen dollars an hour over time, uh, statewide, and. Uh, uh, the restaurant owners are saying we can't afford it, and the, my uh, what's going to end up? People won't tip. The tip way, the tip is not going to be satisfactory, and the waitresses don't want it either. But the governor believes that this is the progressive thing that he should do, and it's I don't know what's going to happen. He hasn't made his final decision yet, but one burden after another after another eventually ends up people uh, closing their shops, going elsewhere, and leaving the state and leaving the city. That, that is the problem he's describing. What's the solution? Well, the solution is hopefully someone will ultimately be, uh, be elected that's going to change that philosophy. And uh, to change that philosophy, you've got to reduce taxes, not increase them. You've got to re reduce, reduce burdens. Uh, uh, the Public Service Commission, it's, it's clearly controlled by the governor. And uh, the only issue in the Public Service Com Commission that's only it's important to them is to be environmentally sound, no matter what the cost may be. But I'll give you, this is, this should get a kick out of it. I did. Um, there's, there's all these environmental groups in the state of New York, and they rate legislators based upon their environmental record. I had the audacity to put in a bill that said before you do your, you spend money on envir so-called environmentally sound uh, uh, programs that you have to do a cost-benefit relationship a study to show what the cost is and what the benefit is. Uh, you know, real radical thought. Uh, you know, it basically should be done with everything. Uh, well, I I, su I uh, uh, supported it. I drafted the bill. It never passed both houses. Uh, but for that a radical bill of mine. I was elected the, I got the Oil Slick Award from one environmental group saying that uh, I'm the least environmentally sound person. So the philosophy with the PSC and with the governor is basically it doesn't matter what the costs are, we're going to show that we're the best environmentalists in the world, whether it makes sense cost-wise or not. And, you know, those are the type of things that uh, that hurt the state of New York. Okay. Um, 
As a senator and as a candidate for governor, you've talked to voters all over the state. What do you hear from them that surprises you? I was surprised at the the uh, depth of the dislike for the current governor. And it doesn't even, I'm not even, I've been talking philosophy and, and issues. It doesn't even go to that point. Uh, people just dislike the way he treats people, dislike the way he throws money around for various economic development projects when they may have their own problems and try to feed their family uh, with the money that's left over after they have to pay the taxes for all of these uh, these uh, particular programs. I was in, I was in uh, New York City uh, making various stops and I went to the subway and I brought someone with a camera, much like the camera you have here, and uh, just talked to people. And uh, two people, I think they were homeless. If they weren't, they weren't doing very well. Uh, they, they, I explained that I'm running for governor and where we, and he's the, one, the man said to me, you're running for governor against Andrew Cuomo? I said, yes. He knelt on the ground and started uh, doing this. I mean, I'm sure that he wasn't uh, just concerned about the issues that we've been talking about. It was just a genuine dislike for the way he's doing business. And that's why I think this year is ripe for someone uh, to take him out. Okay, all right. Um, switching things a, a little bit, um, You've been characterized as a pit bull. You actually had your picture taken with a rapper pit bull, I think, to drive the point home. Now, as you're leaving public office, is the pit bull going to remain your spirit animal? I don't think it can change yourself. I think you are what you are. I, uh, I probably won't be as aggressive uh, because I won't be engaged in as many things as I have been engaged in for the last 41 years in public office. Uh, but. Uh, People are still here for me. I'm still going to provide my opinion. And I don't know what my next phase is going to be. Whatever I do, I don't think you can take uh, uh, the put pit bull out of me because I'll be just as aggressive with what I decide I end up, I'm going to end up doing. All right. Now, you're, you've got a tight schedule all the time. So I'm wondering what your schedule looked like for January 2nd, 2019. Well, I think it's going to be pretty light. In fact, recently, uh, now that session is over, I've been taking a little extra time uh, uh, doing things that I never had the chance of doing. Uh, but on January 2nd, I'm going to be doing nothing. I'm going to be recovering from watching the football games on uh, January 1st, and I'll be uh, just relaxing uh, at home with my wife in July 13th, in about two weeks. My wife and I will have been married 50 years. And we dated six years before that. And uh, I'm not so sure she's that happy that I'm going to be around as much, uh, uh, or a lot more than I was before. But uh, we're going to spend a lot more time together with the camp, with the family and the kids and do some traveling. Wonderful. John, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good talk with you. Appreciate it.